tonight, well, as we begin, we're going to be spending most of this period, if not all of this period, going over module two for your SAT prep. So again, most of them multiple choice, four options. Some of them no multiple choice. All of them calculator use permitted. And of course, you have all of the formulas you're gonna need. And we did need some of these on one of these problems. We need a couple of vol volume formulas, like even I, as I was working, like, let me double check and make sure I remember that correctly. I'm pretty sure it's this, but I'd hate to be wrong, you know? So good opportunity to double check some things there. Well, let's take a look at these. See how we did. Number one, Tilly earns P dollars for every W hours of work. Which expression represents the amount of money in dollars that Tilly earns for 39 W hours of work? P dollars, if I'm guessing Tilly is a girl, P dollars if she works W hours. So if she works 39 W hours, how much does she make? Adam? A. A, 39 times P whatever that P dollars is. Number two, uh, for a training program, Juan rides his bike at an average rate of 5.7 minutes per mile. Not gonna lie guys, this threw me off. I thought it said miles per minute. And so I got the wrong answer. It's minutes per mile. Who does that? I don't know. Every mile takes him 5.7 minutes, okay? And so which of these functions of M models the number of minutes it will take Juan to ride X miles? takes 5.7 minutes for every single mile. So if he rides X miles, how many minutes will it take him? Josh? Yeah, I put A as well, because I was picturing miles per minute. But if it's minutes per mile, then we will put D is the correct answer. Yeah, I was shocked. I was going through checking my answers by the score key. And I'm like, D? How in blazes did I miss a problem this easy? Oh, you're kidding me. Minutes per mile. Anyway, whatever, whatever. Yeah, but Point is, read carefully, Whoa. all right? <laughs> so, all right, number three. This one's, I thought it was pretty easy. They give you a system of equations, 3x equals 12, and they say that negative 3x plus y equals negative 6. What did you get for this? Back to Josh? B, B 6. Did you get that also? I felt like rather than saying, well, x equals 4, who cares what x equals? If 12 is 3x, then where it says negative 3x, I put negative 12. And just add 12 to both sides to get 6. So I thought that was really straightforward. Any questions at all there? All right, number four. Uh, this equation gives the speed in terms of miles per hour of a certain car, uh, of a certain car, t seconds after it begins to accelerate. Okay? What is the speed in miles per hour of the car five seconds after it began to accelerate? Adam? D, 55 is correct. Based on the formula, how fast was the car going initially, class? 40. And every second, it speeds up how many miles per hour? Three miles per hour every second of acceleration. That's what the formula means. Right? If you were trying to extrapolate speed as a base speed of 40 was already traveling, then it begins accelerating three miles an hour per second. So for five seconds, plug it in, get you 55. Questions on that? All right, I point that out because there's going to be another problem later that says, what does this equation mean? and kind of figuring out what the various numbers, values mean. Number five is insulting. Um, they tell you that A is four and B is five and they ask for C, but they don't even let you give the real answer. You just have to express it out. And so, Josh, it is D, the square root of four squared plus five squared. So if you're like me, you're like, oh, it's the square root of 41. That's not an option. Are you kidding? They didn't even actually do the work? Yeah, so Pythagorean theorem. Um, Uh-oh, Adam, what'd you put? C. Ah, uh, don't forget to square uh, them no. and add them. Square and add. <laughs> All right. Number six, you actually get to just solve an equation. It's like what we did in seventh grade and eighth grade and ninth grade and eleventh grade. Um, what's the answer to the equation? Uh, Adam? 40. 40 is correct. Number seven is also insulting. It's stupid easy. So easy you probably overthought it. Like I literally read it twice thinking it can't be this easy. Yeah, it really is. What's the x-intercept of the graph, Josh? Seven. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's literally all it wanted. <laughs> so, again, there's a mix of some crazy hard ones that are coming up, and then there's that, that one. It's just like, really? Like What's the x-intercept? <laughs> anyway, there you go. That's what they wanted, seven. Uh, number eight. Now, it says f of x equals. Mm -hmm. But we know f of x really just means, guys, function of x, or in other words, y, right? Oh, oh, yeah. So if you don't think of this as f of x equals, if you think of this as y equals 1 tenth x negative 2, 
Well, this is in what form already? Slope intercept form. They disguised it by putting it in a function notation, but it's in slope intercept form. Where we know that 1 tenths class is the slope and negative 2 is the y intercept. And it literally just asks, what's the y intercept? Well, obviously, class, it's negative 2. Here's the question Is it A, negative 2, 0, or is it B, 0, negative 2? And she's like, hold on, hold on. Negative 2. Over nothing down to, so class, the answer is. B, 0, negative 2. 0, negative 2, not negative 2, 0. But I can see that one's potentially throwing you off just a little bit. Adam, did it get you? Uh, I can see. Ooh, careful. The 1 tenth is the slope. Rise 1, run 10. Do you see it now? Well, I know, like, the 0 is, like, x axis and the negative 2 is the y. So I right, 0 on the x, negative 2 on the y, so the y intercept. Yeah. Yep. All right. Questions on that now? That makes sense now? Again, it's, it's with slope intercept form, but they just disguised it by putting f of x equals. It's like, oh, wait just a minute here. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all. Uh, though technically, in function notation, if we were to leave it in function notation, remember a, a y-intercept is all the values of x is 0, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5. So literally, you could just say, well, the y-intercept is f of 0. Well, a tenth times 0 is 0 minus 2 is negative 2. So you could have gotten it that way as well. But I just wanted you to see that it was slope-intercept form. Um, number nine. The function f is defined by f of x equals 7x cubed. The graph of y equals g of x is the result of shifting the graph of y equals f of x down two units. Which equation defines g? Now, for this, guys, you've got to go back to what we talked about with parabolas in Algebra 2. Remember we said that if we have a function of x equals x squared, that's your basic parabola with its vertex at the origin and over 1, up 1, over 1, up 3. Do you remember that? But I said if you wanted to shift it vertically, up or down, you would add or subtract any random number. If it said plus 5, it would go up 5. If it said minus 4, it would go down 4. What do we need to do with a 7x cubed if all we want to do is shift it down 2? Put a negative 2 at the back of it, so letter D. D. Did you figure that out? Mm -hmm. Excellent, good. So if you, if, for those watching on YouTube, then they remember, but if you're watching on YouTube, if you forgot, that's all it is. Slapping a negative 2 on the back automatically shifts it down 2 units. Number 10, kind of a fun one. Uh, which ordered pair is a solution to this given system? x plus 7 equals 10, and x plus 7 quantity squared equals y. What did you have, Josh? Yeah. A, 3, 100. I think the 3 is pretty obvious, isn't it? x plus 7 equals 10. Okay, x is 3. Well, all of them have the x is 3. How do you figure out the y? Well, x plus 7 is already 10, right? So if x plus 7 squared is y, then 10 squared is y, so y is 100. Do we all get that? Letter A for number 10? Excellent. Number 11. This goes back to like algebra 1, remove parentheses, combine like terms. Uh, Adam, what did you get on number 11? Oh, Adam, the pain. The pain. Um, Whenever we have parentheses preceded by a negative, Adam, what do we got to do? Uh, oh, Adam. I taught you Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. This hurts. So would it would have been A. It would have been A. Yeah, parentheses preceded by a negative change the signs. These are preceded by a positive. Don't change nothing. This is preceded by a negative, make it a negative 6x cubed. This is preceded by a negative, make it a positive 3x. So, yes, 1x cubed, positive 10x. Letter A would have been our correct answer. Josh, did you have that? Oh, you didn't let me down. It's okay, Adam, I still love you. Number 12. <laughs> Number 12. Just sorely disappointed. That's just, that's just making All right. Hey, that's why we review, right? That's the whole reason we're doing this, right? Is to review over little things that may throw us off on the actual SAT test, right? So. Number 12, uh, p of n is 7n cubed. What is the value of n if p of n is 56? Hmm, Josh, what'd you have? A. A, 2 is correct. How would you do this? Well, it says that p of n is 7n cubed, right? But then it says, well, what if p of n is 56? Then replace p of n with 56. How do we solve, guys? Divide by 7. To get? A equals n cubed. And then take the? Cubed root of 8. And again, you could do these steps mentally. You don't have to work them out on paper. I did it all mentally. Cube root of 8 is obviously 2, so the answer is A. Did you both have A? Excellent. Okay, you redeemed yourself, Adam. All right. Uh, page 13, or page 45, technically. Number 13, though. 
And uh, hey, a little geometry here. We got some parallel lines cut by a Trans transversal. And we know that alternate interior angles are uh, equal. equal. Alternate exterior angles are equal. equal. We know corresponding angles are equal. But if they ain't equal, going all the way back to eighth grade math, if they ain't equal, they're going to wind up being supplementary. supplementary. Well, is angle X one of those three pairs we talked about with 110 degrees? No. no, it ain't alternate interior, alternate exterior, or corresponding, which means it ain't equal to 110 degrees. It has to then be supplementary, so it must be 70 degrees. Now, on the SAT test, there's not degree symbols, and you notice it already said X degrees. You don't need the degree symbol. You just put 70 for your answer. Okay? So on the digital SAT, there's not really a way to enter the degree necessarily, so you would just say 70 for your answer. I saw on the front, it said, like, don't include any signs. Right, and the instructions at the beginning tell you don't include yeah. symbols and stuff like that. Yeah. So 70 yeah. by itself would be the solution there. But if you had 70 degrees, you knew what to do, and again, I think the digital SAT would kind of invalid symbol entered or something. You're like, oh, I guess they don't want the degree symbol. But I wrote 70 degrees initially, and even as I wrote it, I think, I don't know that they want the degree symbol. I'm going to check the answer key sure enough. They don't want the degree symbol, so just 70. Do we get 70, though? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Number 14. Hmm. This goes back to junior high math or last year when we did a little bit with statistics at the very end of the year. It asks for the mean of the data set. What does mean mean in class? Average. Average. So we have to add them all up and divide by, well, it tells us right there there's 10 data values. So add them up, divide by 10, and add up, what do we get? Oh, okay. You picked most. Well, most common, did you put five? Five is the mode most common. If we had ranked the data, the middle value would be the median. But for the mean, we add them up, divide by how many? Or, a little reminder from Algebra 2, if you wanted to enter as 6 sigma plus, 8 sigma plus, 16 sigma plus, uh, 4 sigma plus, and so forth, then you do second function x bar. Remember, x bar is the symbol for mean. That would do the same thing. It'll average it for you, or just add them up and divide by 10. Either way, what do we get for our answer, Josh? 10 is correct. Do you have it now, Adam? Excellent. All right, questions on mean. Questions on mean. Number 15, here's the one I was talking about, where they give you a number, an equation. They tell you, what are we talking about here? So they give you the equation, e of t equals 5 times 1.8 to the t gives the estimated number of employees at a restaurant, where T is the number of years since the restaurant opened. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number five in this context? Uh, Josh, what did you have? It is A. It's how many employees the restaurant started with. Notice, whatever's raised to the power is what's affected by time, right? Well, they're going to add employees every year as the business grows, you would hope, right? Uh, again, when you first start out, you got just a few people working for you, and then it starts to get popular, and there's long lines, you got to add more people. And as it, more people, more people keep coming, you just keep adding more work, because then you add later hours, add a lunch shift, add a breakfast shift, whatever, right? So, um, yeah, so you're going to add employees as time goes on. The number of employees you start with doesn't change as time goes on. That's just a set number. So since five is the set number, that's how many employees they had to begin with. Now, 1.8 is another way of saying 180%. What that means is every year, the number of employees goes up 180%. So 80% more than it used to have. So if you had five employees, what's 80% of that? Four. Four is 80%, right? Four fifths. So that means that in the next year, they add in their first year of operation, they just have five people. In the next year of operation, they add four more, so now they're up to nine. The next year, they add another 80%, which is really weird because that's 7.2 employees. So now they have 16.2 employees in their next year and so forth. Does that make sense? Um, but uh, so I guess they would have to round to the nearest whole employee. Or they have a part-timer. That would actually make some sense, too. Uh, but yeah, five is the number of people they started with. Does that make sense now? All right. Uh, number 16. Um, Oh, this is, yeah, this is stupid easy. What's the minimum value of the given function? Adam? B. B, 55. Because think about it. No matter what you plug in for x, as soon as you square it, it makes it positive, right? There is no way to make this value smaller, so whatever you get out is going to be 55 or bigger. Remember we talked about domain and range in Algebra 2. 
The range is what you get out. Domain, you plug anything you want in for x, but the only things you're getting out will be 55 or greater. And so that's hence the minimum value. So it kind of goes back to domain and range concepts from algebra 2. Number 17, I'm not going to lie. This is a terminology play only, all right? Go ahead and read it for us, though, if you would, Josh. The value of an investment increases by 0.49% of its value the previous year. Which of the following functions best models how the value of your investment changes over time? All right, so it's growing, right? Mm -hmm. So we can already rule out two of these options. Which options can we rule out immediately, guys, if it's growing? Yeah, we can cross out the A and B. We know it's not decreasing. It's obviously increasing. So it begs the question, is it increasing exponentially or is it increasing linearly? Now, I'm very literal here because this isn't terminology I'm that actually familiar with. And so I was like, well, if you were to graph this, it would be a straight line. So I said increasing linear. But apparently the terminology linear, to me, an exponential curve is something that does this. Not necessarily a parabola, but sort of like a parabola. And a linear is that. I'm thinking graphing concepts. In terms of changing an investment, if something grows by a set monetary amount, for instance, you make an extra five bucks every month, only five bucks every month, that's considered linear growth. If something goes up by a percentage, then one month it goes up five bucks, the next month will be five bucks and 10 cents, then it'll be like five bucks, 21 cents. That's considered exponential, even though it doesn't follow an exponential graphing curve. It graphs linearly, but technically, anytime something grows by a percent or shrinks by a percent of change, it's considered exponential. So that's not something we go into in any of my classes. So if you didn't know that, now you should have been able to narrow it down to C or D. Do we understand that now? Why we should be able to narrow it down to those? But that's just a little fact to tuck away. If there's a constant percent of change, it's exponential. If there's a constant amount of change, it's considered linear. So I learned something, because that's not something that I've ever had reason to dive into. And again, to me, I've always looked at linear referring to the graphing concepts, and that wasn't the way they were approaching it here. So there we go. C is the correct answer. Did either of you guess C by any chance? Yeah, me neither. All right. <laughs> I guess B. All right. So now we know. All right. Number 18. Uh, Greenville population increased by 7% from 2015 to 2016. If the 2016 population is K times the population of 2015, what's the value of K? Let's see if they baited you well, Adam. C. It is C. And there's a little, there's a little trick here. It didn't go, it isn't 7% of the population. It's 7% more than it used to be. Does that make sense? And remember for percent more than or less than, going all the way back to junior high now, you always add or subtract from 100%. So if it says 7% more than or 7% increase, that means we now have 107% or 1.07. What if though, bubonic plague racked the city of Greenville and their population was uh, now 6% uh, less than, what percent would it be now, class? It would be 94%, whereas a decimal 0 0.94, 0 0.94, right? So less than, subtract from 100%, more than, add to 100%. So just kind of tuck that thought away there. So you put A, I know what you were thinking, but that means they baited you. And uh, watch out for that increased by. Very tricky wording. Speaking of tricky, number 19, they sure made this thing annoyingly complicated. It didn't have to be this bad because you already know fractional exponents. You learned them in both 11th or in uh, algebra one and algebra two. You know that in a fractional exponent, the denominator is the the thing out front. The thing out front, the index or the root, right? It's the root. So we know we've got a 12th root, and then the uh, numerator is the the power inside power, the radicand. That's what I mean. So we know this. Like we can do 12 root of a to the 11th, and then you look at the options. You're like, uh oh, it's not here, right? So we've got to get creative here. Notice 12th root a to the 11th. No. So I could cross out a. 11th root. No, 11 is definitely not the root. We can cross out d. Is there a way to make a 12 turn into a 121? No. So we can cross out c, which means it has to be b. But just to make sure, before we move on, how would I make a 12 into a 144? 
times 12. How would I turn an 11 into a 132 also times 12? And remember, as long as you multiply these two numbers by the same thing, it's still valid. So a to the 121, 130 seconds is the same thing as a to the 11, uh, or one, excuse me, 132, a to the 132, 144, excuse me, is the same thing as a, I'm looking at that like that's not right, a to the 11 twelfths, right? So I guess a similar problem, if you had something like a to the 5 6 well again, normally how would we write a to the 5 6, Adam? Root. All right, but let's suppose I wanted an index of 24. Well, what would the radic what would the radicand's exponent have to become, Josh? 20. 20, because you have to multiply both by the same value. Do you remember that from algebra now? So, well, normally we reduce it back down, but they, in this case, they want an unreduced answer, which was a little obnoxious. But yeah, there we go, letter B. Did either of you have B by any chance? You did figure out B? Does it make sense now? All right, number 20. And uh, read it for us, Adam. An event planner is planning a party. It costs the event planner with one time fee of twenty-five dollars to rent the venue and ten dollars and twenty-five cents per attendee. The event planner has a budget of two hundred dollars, with the greatest number of attendees possible without exceeding their budget. All right. Now I will say this: those are really reasonable rates. Uh, my sister got married this past uh, summer, and man, what she would have given to have a fee of only ten twenty-five per person and only a one-time fee of thirty-five bucks. So this is. Clearly not one of those super expensive venues or anything like that. But um, yeah, it says, what's the greatest number of attendees possible? What did you have for your answer, Adam? 16. 16, also 16. 16. We, I honestly, I didn't really write a formula for this. I just like, well, we got 200 bucks, right? Let's take off 35 bucks right away because we're spending that immediately. And then we'll divide by 1025. If you wanted to write it out, you'd say there's a one-time fee of 35 plus $10.25 per person, P, and that's got to be less than or equal to $200 max budget. But again, what are you gonna end up doing? Subtracting 35 and dividing 10.25, like, so you do the steps without writing the formula out, but that would be the formula. Uh, Josh, question on that? I didn't put the less than or equal, but it's the equal. Well, again, technically, because you don't have to spend all 200, you could spend less, it's just 200 is your max. Make sense? So technically it would be an inequality, but it did come out and ask what is the max. So by using equal sign, you're still gonna get the same number. Yeah, good question. Instead of like just dividing by 1025, I like got rid of the decimal. Oh, you even did all of that, the point, point? Yeah. Oh. Well, I will say this, in algebra one, it was really important to do because we didn't have a calculator. Yeah, true. Let this do all the heavy lifting, you know, I gotta do all that. All right, number 21. That's a pretty interesting problem. Uh, if the absolute value of 4x minus 4 is 112, then what's the positive value of x negative 1? Now, you remember absolute value equations, guys. There's a positive negative. Anytime there's absolute value, positive negative, they don't want the positive negative. Just forget about the negative side of things here. What's the value? And Josh, what did you have? 28. 28 is correct. Did you have the same thing, Adam? 26. Oh, the pain. All right, so they don't have this. They have, uh, what was it, 112, there we go. They have this. But you see, Adam, that to go from here to here, if they only want the positive value, these are really kind of unnecessary, aren't they? Because they only want the positive value anyway. And how do I turn this into that? Just divide out a four. Boom, there's my 28. Yep. <laughs> so they didn't want x, they just wanted they wanted the x minus 1. So literally all you had to do is take what they provided, divide the 4 out of it, and when you divide the 4 out of the other side, it gets you your answer. Make sense? All right, number 22. This is where you were thankful for that formula page, weren't you guys? Because they start you off with a cube. And this cube has an edge length of 15 inches. 68 inches per edge. Now, that means that the, they talk about volume here in just a moment, right? They're talking about volume. To find the volume of the cube, we would need the formula. V equals, you flip back to that first page. Did it have a formula? It sure did. 
The LWH. LWH. Now, that's for a rectangular prism, but you realize a cube is that. We used to say E cubed, but you wouldn't be wrong if you said LWH, right? 68 times 68 times 68 is the same as 68 cubed. So when you multiply that out, you get really big number. Make sense? We can do it in a minute, but we get big, okay? We'll just leave it there because we're lazy. Now, inside this cube, I could fit, because it's a perfect cube, I could fit a ball. How tall is the ball allowed to be? Don't look at the problem, just picture it. How tall is the ball allowed to be if it fits in the box? Less than 68. 68 inches exact would just put it inside that box, correct? And if it was 68 tall, it would also be 68 wide, which in both ways, which would be perfect. It would fit just right. Well, they do. They put a, a, a you kind of see it from the cross section here. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. You get, you get the idea. But they tell us that the radius of this sphere, this ball, is what? Um, 34. Which means it fits perfectly, doesn't it? Because 34 radius is a 68 diameter. It just snugly fits. Now, we realize this, though, that this corner here has some empty space, doesn't it? And so does this corner, that corner. All the corners have some empty space in it. All four corners of the box. Or, excuse me, all eight corners of the box have some empty space in it. How would we figure out the volume of the empty space? Did you realize that's what they were asking for? Find the volume of the empty space. Well, I gotta figure out what the volume of the sphere is. So we look at that page and we find out the volume of the sphere. Uh, equals four thirds pi r cubed. Four thirds pi r cubed. So four thirds times pi times 34 cubed, and we get uh, not as big. Now, that's the volume of the sphere. Volume of the cube, big. Volume of the sphere, not quite as big. How do I figure out the volume of the empty space? Subtract. Just subtract those numbers. What did you get for your answer on 22, Adam? A. It is letter A, almost exactly. 149,796, I think it was 795.7 or something like that. But yeah, almost exactly letter A, our answer. Did you both have that, letter A? I did not. Does it make sense now? Use the formula to find the volume, use the formula to find the other volume, and since you want an empty space, just subtract the two volumes from each other. Well, big minus not as big, technically. All right, questions on that? Number 23. Ah, and this goes back to module one, where I introduced you to a formula for the uh, area of a, or for a uh, circle. Remember I said a circle is going to have the formula x minus x1 squared plus y minus y1 squared equals r squared. Do you remember that? where the x1 and the y1 give you the center of the circle, and the r is the radius. Well, they give you a formula, but what's in the spot that I have r squared listed? 16, 16 is r squared, therefore the radius must equal 4. But it didn't ask what's the radius. It said what's the diameter. So class, what's the diameter? 8. So answer B is correct. Did you get that? Uh, does it make sense now? Again, if this were r, you'd be right with 32, and that's what they were wondering if you do. But r squared is 16, so r is just four diameters eight. By the way, what is the center on number 23? They didn't ask, but what is it? Five, three. Right, because they have the number five right here, the number three right there, so five, three. Make sense? All right, questions on number 23. And we'll talk more about that later in pre-cal, so I'm not too, too worried about that, but I'd like you to be able to get the circle ones right because they will ask at least one circle one somewhere on your SAT or ACT, I almost guarantee you. Um, so since I know it's coming, even though it doesn't come till later in the curriculum, wouldn't hurt to know that now. All right, questions there? Number 24. Oh, boy, this one was fun. <laughs> Go ahead and read it for us, Josh. <laughs> For the exponential function f, the value of f of 1 is k, where k is a constant. Which of the following equivalent forms of the function f shows the value of k as the coefficient of k? All right, now, let me help you translate that last sentence. Which of these functions shows the value of k? Okay, so f of 1 is something. They're saying, which of these functions shows you that number, that something? It's already on the picture, either as a coefficient or the base. Now, on the first function, what's the coefficient? Um, 50, 50, right? 50 is a coefficient because it's being multiplied by something. Yeah. What's the base? The 1.6. 1. 1. Look at letter B. What's the coefficient? 
80, what's the base? One by, okay, so we understand what, what base and, and uh, coefficient mean, right? So which of these, if you plugged in f of 1, you would still have one of these numbers as your answer? That's literally the way what it was trying to ask. And it took me a while to get that. I'm not going to lie. I got the wrong answer when I did it. And when I looked it up and saw what the right answer was, I kind of figured out what they were saying. They're basically saying, in which of these, if you found f of 1, would one of these two numbers not change? Well, here's the question. Can you raise something to a power and it not change? Yes, if you raise it to the first power. So in my mind, I thought, oh, well, it's got to be letter B, because if I raise 1.6 to the first power, it wouldn't change. But the 1.6 then has to be multiplied by the 80, and that just made it change. Dadgum it. Okay. So that's when I realized it's letter C. Because if you took 1 minus 1 as the exponent, you would get what power? And anything to the 0 power equals, which if you multiply 1 by 128, you get what? 128. And in that function, there is a coefficient that does not change. It remains as the answer. Really confusingly worded question. Not going to lie. Not a fan of that question. Well, obviously, probably because I got it wrong and I don't like missing stuff. But it took me a while. Like, what are they even asking? But that's the nature of the SAT on some questions. Now, again, if every question was like that, I'd just be telling you, don't take the SAT. But there have been enough easy ones in here. You know, you can afford to miss a, a hard one here or there, unless, of course, you're trying to get into Yale or Stanford or something like that. Then you don't want to miss very many at all. But again, <laughs> barring something like that, you can afford to miss one of these nutso problems. But do you kind of understand what they're saying now? Really hard reading between the lines, even for me as a math teacher on that one. But uh, there we go. And uh, questions on 24. Number 25. I missed this one too, and I was really ticked that I missed it because there were two words I missed that I already emphasized to you earlier in this. Read number 25 for us. Let's see. We're at Adam's turn. A model estimates that at the end of each year from 2015 to 2020, the number of scores in the population was 150% more than the number of scores in the population at the end of the previous year. The model estimates that at the end of 2016, there were 180 squirrels in population. Which of the following equations represent this model where n is the estimated number of squirrels in population two years after the end of 2015 and t is less than 5? I was going to read with 5. All right. So they're looking for a model that shows this. We start with a certain number of squirrels, and every year the squirrels multiply, not quite like rabbits, but they multiply 150%, and here's the two words I didn't see, more than the year before. All right, Mr. Nadaski. Whenever we see percent more than, what are we supposed to do? Add to 100%. So what's the actual percent going to be, guys? 250%. I thought the Curse the more than that I did not see, right? Not 150% of the population, 150% more than the population. So we're going to have a 250% or a 2.5 which means we can cross out my original answer and as well as letter C. A and C can both go, okay? Both of those can go. So we know it's a 2.5 T. Now here's the question. What number leads it off? Well, the number in the text is 180, but look at when it says there were 180 squirrels. At the end of 2016, that's one year after they began the study, which means 180 isn't what the squirrels started out as. What did the scroll start out at? 72. And if you grow 250% of 72, you'll get to 180. So 72 times 2.5 to the T is the model that shows squirrel population growth. Now, okay, so keep in mind, one year has passed. So 2.5 to the first is 2.5. So 180 squirrels in the population is 250% of whatever they started as the year before. This is 2016. 2015 is what we need to put right here because that's when the study starts. So 180 is 250%, 150% more than what number? X. So we say that 180 equals 2.5X. If you divide both sides by 2.5, you get 72. Really, since there were only two options, 180s and 72s, it just took knowing, and I did recognize this much, it didn't start at 180. 180 is a year later, so it had to have started at 72. 
I just missed the more than it was kind of frustrated <laughs> by it. But yeah, there we go. It's uh, letter B is our correct answer. Do, does it make sense now? So again, a second time where that more than percent more than watch for that on SAT testing. All right, and again, that's why we do the prep. That's why we go over these questions. Number 26, this is fun. Uh, they got a system of equations there. 5x plus 7y equals 1, and then ax plus by equals 1. And it says that a and b are constant values. They want to know, based on what a and b are, which of these also represents a pair of perpendicular lines. All right, so let me go back to something we learned in algebra, but we haven't applied it this way yet. This is also coming up later this year, so I'm going to give you a preview here. So if you missed it, don't, don't beat yourself up. We should remember, though, whenever we talk about parallel lines, guys, parallel lines have the same slope. Parallel, this kind of lines, same slope, right? Perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal slope. So let's assume for a moment they start us off with 5x plus 7y equals 1. You do realize that as long as this number, if I keep the same 5x plus 7y equals anything, that when you get the y by itself in slope-intercept form, if these numbers match, guys, it's still going to be a parallel line, right? Even if it was a 10 and a 14, it's still going to be a parallel line. Even if it's a 50 and a 70, it's still going to be a parallel line because it's going to make same slope. If you wanted to make negative reciprocal slope, and this is something, again, I'm going to teach uh, second semester in this class. Negative reciprocal slope means I've got to flip these two values. Because this would be rise, this would, excuse me, this would be rise, yeah, when we end up setting it equal to y equals mx plus b, your rise is going to be here, your run's going to be here. I've got to switch and say 7x and 5y to switch rise with run. That's reciprocal. But I also want negative reciprocal. So 7x minus 5y equals is going to make perpendicular lines. That's what it comes down to. You haven't learned that yet. So if you missed this one, that's fine. This isn't based on something you have learned. It's something you will learn. Kind of like circles, you're going to learn it later. So just kind of, if you, if you can get this now, great. If not, oh, well, I tried. Okay, but you'll definitely get it later on when I teach it officially. But yeah, you switch the numbers and you change the sign, you're going to create perpendicular lines. So like, okay, right now, I already know that A must be 7. And B must be negative 5. Look at the original given system. If A is a 7 and if B is a negative 5, boom, they're perpendicular lines. Got it? So I just need to find another system where if A is still 7 and if B is still negative 5, my lines will still be perpendicular. Well, if A is 7 in letter B, notice if A is 7, that's perfect, because it's changing places with where it was on the y. And if b is negative 5, then the coefficient of y is now negative 10, which is the inverse of the old 10 in front of the x. And that's why b is the correct answer. 7 moves in front of the x. The negative 10 now takes the place of the coefficient of y, and there's your perpendicular lines. All right? So, let's just throw a random problem out here. Let's suppose I had a 3x minus 10y equals 17. Again, the number at the end doesn't make any difference whatsoever. What would make this perpendicular class is if we had what number in front of the x? And what number in front of the y? Except, the <laughs> sign's got to change here, so we're going to make it a positive. All right? So we're going to change this sign, and we're going to swap these two numbers. That makes it perpendicular. Follow? Okay. So if I said um, 6x plus 5y equals 12, and I said that um, jx plus ay equals 6, if these are perpendicular, what's the value of j? Negative 5. Eh, careful. Just 5. What's the value of a? Negative. Negative, because that's where the sign changes, negative 6. Does that make sense? So we just trade the numbers with each other, and then the sign changes. If it was negative, it becomes positive. If it was positive, here it would have to become negative. So that allows us to identify what the numbers would have to be. Now, what if I said the lines were parallel? Well, then j would equal 6, and a would equal 
Fine. Fine, right? Nothing changes. If they're parallel, it's the same numbers. If they're perpendicular, the yeah. numbers swap and the sign changes. Again, all of that's coming up next semester in pre-calculus, but you're not waiting that long to take the SAT, so there's a little bit of a preview there for you. Number 27. Two ways to go about it, both of which we talked about in Algebra 2. Read the problem for us. Not the equation, but read the problem under the equation, Josh. Um, in the given equation, c is a constant. The equation has no real solution if c is greater than a. What is the least possible value of c? All right, in other words, if c is too big, you don't get any real solutions. Now, you might remember, gentlemen, a formula. <laughs> okay, this is a quadratic, right? So you remember the quadratic formula? x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Remember that? And I told you that this radicand was called the discriminant. Remember? I said if this thing is negative, you ain't got no answers. Right? And so the question is, what value of c would force a negative down here? Make sense? Because after all, b squared is going to be a nice big number, but if c, a, and c are too big, then you're still going to subtract something away that's going to force a negative. So let's start with b. What is b in this particular equation, guys, on number 27? Uh, negative 34. Negative oh. 34, which positive or negative doesn't matter, because yeah. when you square it, you're going to square it to get, well, what is 34 squared? 1156. 1156, okay, minus 4 times, what is a? Uh, 1. 1, okay, and then c is the unknown value, right? All of this needs to stay greater than or equal to 0 to avoid getting some kind of imaginary value. So, let's do this. If we multiply negative 4 times 1 times c, that's, four. move it over as a positive 4c. That means 4c has to be less than or equal to 1156. Now what do I do? Divide by 4. Divide by 4. And that means that c has to be less than or equal to what number? 289. Did either of you have 289? You did. You did not. Did you do it this way? You did. Well, just the discriminant. Right, just the discriminant portion, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, impressive. You remembered the discriminant. Good for you. Bravo. I didn't do it this way initially. I realized later I could have done it this way. Here's how I did it. I looked at x squared minus 34x plus c equals 0. I'm like, well, I can complete the square. You remember completing the square? You ditch the c as a negative c. And you half and square. Well, we can cut 34 in half, but guys, 17, and then square it to get 289. That means I'm also going to add a 289 to the other side. That's going to give me an x negative 17 squared equals whatever, right? And then I'm going to have to take the square root of both sides. I can't take the square of this side, though, at least not with real numbers. I'd get imaginary numbers. If the c right here is a 289 or, well, actually not 289, but greater than 289, right? Because negative greater than 289 plus only 289 gives me negative. That's how I got the 289. I completed the square and found the number that way. Either way works. Right? Either way works. As long as you recognize you can't take square root of negative, either way you end up trying and finding out your limit. Questions on that? All right, so again, kind of like the last one, I felt like there were about four or five doozies. Yeah. There were about four or five more that were okay, kind of challenging, but we can see them. And then there were you know, at least a, a dozen or ish that were maybe a little bit more that were like, okay, that's easy. So, you've got an idea of what the SAT presents as you make your choice. We'll do more ACT prep again as well. We've been doing quite a bit of ACT prep in the last uh, several lessons. Um, but as we're doing all of this, you're kind of deciding which one do I want to take. Now, if you can't make up your mind which, you could take both. Whichever you score a higher percentage-wise, that's the one the college is going to use for admission. So, college is always based off your better score, relatively. And so... Um, you could take both, but I'm hoping to save you time and money where you don't want to spend multiple Saturdays taking tests, right? You don't want to drop 68, 69 bucks on a test over and over again. Don't want to do that. So, so um, it's better to just do one and be at my, Well, because I'm lazy and I'm cheap. So for me, lazy and cheap, I just want to take one and be done with it, right? I want to take the one I think I've got the best chance at and then take that one. But again, um, you, uh, 
the point was I want to make sure you had an opportunity to do this. Now, you could do more of this kind of prep for other subjects as well. For the SAT, they also have English and reading, right? You could do that sort of thing online. We just don't do it in math class. For the ACT, you could do the reading and the language or English and the science sections online, do all that practice work. Again, I'm just focused on the math side because that's my game. <laughs> well, we can we can work on that then. All right, any questions at all on this? All right. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day.